Of course, you yeah, looked definitely. into body composition changes in football players over the course of a season in collegiate players and a four-year career. Uh, can you walk listeners through that study setup and, and some of the key findings there? Absolutely. Um, so like you mentioned, football is a unique sport. Uh, we've got um, pretty unique demands on the athlete in terms of size and power and mobility. Um, speed, obviously, is a huge part of the game. So body composition is, is naturally uh, quite important. You know, th- there's a huge focus on it in the off season when, when, when young players show up on a college campus to play football. One of the first things that the strength staff kind of decides is, are you at a suitable body composition kind of position for what you for what your role is on the team? And if not, what do we have to do? How much muscle do we have to put on? How much total weight? Um, so certainly body composition is important. But, you know, you mentioned you had Greg on to talk periodization. And from for the bodybuilder and the powerlifter, periodization, we get very technical about it, but there's a lot of wiggle room. You know, w- when the sport is lifting – you have a lot of freedom to tailor your your program perfectly to what you're trying to peak at. Absolutely. When it comes to when it comes to football or really any athletic sport, periodization gets a lot more technical because all of a sudden you're in the middle of a season. And so you need to spend a substantial amount of your training hours doing sport specific tasks. And at that point, you have to be very careful about making sure that the weight room stuff and the conditioning stuff is being tailored to perfectly complement that training. You know, basically you have limited opportunities to maintain muscle, power, strength, uh, because there's so much more time spent on the technical aspects of the sport. So um, with that as kind of the backdrop, one of the things we, we like to do with, with my, the lab group I was at, uh, that, that I was with at UNC, was track body composition over you know, longitudinal periods of time to basically see when we look over a season or over a year or over several years is what you're doing in terms of strength and the nutrition staff, is it actually conducive to, uh, what we're trying to do with body composition or at the very least, are you, are you weathering the challenges of a season? Uh, so for this study, we had the one year tracking, which involved 57, uh, high level college football players, And they were measured in March, May, July, and March. Um, And basically, whenever you're working with a sports team, there's kind of some give and take of you'd like to measure things as frequently as possible. (laughs) But but you you kind of just have to take what you can get. Exactly. Um, It's a very collaborative thing. So it kind of depends on when the team has time for it and what makes sense for your research questions. It's very – there's a lot of give and take. Um, so with the one year tracking, you know, we had 57 athletes. What we found is pretty interesting. Um, there really wasn't much of a weight change from start to end. Um, not much at all. What we did see was a significant loss of fat and significant increases in lean mass and bone mineral content. Um, and so basically, if you're using DEXA, which is what we used for, for body composition assessment, you, you can actually kind of separate three different um, uh, compartments out and just look at fat tissue, lean, soft tissue and bone mineral content. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so from, from those results within the one year, basically what we can look at is, um, you know, we can go back to the, the, the staff and the coaching, you know, strength and conditioning staff and say, here's kind of how the trends went from time point to time point, which is informative, but also in the aggregate overall, it looks like the programming is effective at, you know, combating some of those challenges, you know, you worry about lean tissue loss during the season as it starts to get harder and harder to really get them into the weight room for the type of training volume you'd you'd like to get. Uh, so the one year results were quite good. Um, and there, there are some, some studies showing kind of less favorable changes in the one year timeframe. And that really comes down to how effectively you are, are managing the, the limited training opportunities you get uh, and, and how well you've periodized within the year. Yeah, I mean, it's a great insight to be able to, to put your finger on exactly what's going on there. And, and in your study, did you find any differences in, in between skill positions and alignment over that period of time? Uh, within the one-year time frame, not really. Um, I mean, you know, the, obviously the mean changes weren't exactly on the dot, but there was no real 
huge trend that really jumped out. Um, what you see is that absolute changes tend to be a little bit bigger over, I mean, just generally speaking, with linemen compared to non-linemen. Um, and, and that that's what you asked, right? Linemen versus non-linemen? Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's just because they're bigger people. So even if they, you know, if your wide receivers and your linemen each have a 1% loss in, in their fat mass, that's going to be bigger in the linemen in, in absolute terms. Oh, for sure. But, um, you know, they, they really had quite similar trends, relatively speaking. And, and I think that's because, you know, they might tailor training a little bit here and there from, from group to group, but they're still facing the same rigors of of the training season. They're on the field, similar amounts of time. They're in the weight room, similar amounts of time. So it looked like everybody was pretty much following the same trends, looking at averages. Um, and like you mentioned, we also did a, a kind of four year tracking and obviously getting complete data for, for four entire years is much more challenging. So very small subset of 13 athletes that we had four complete years of, of data and they were just measured every March over that kind of full athletic career. And what we found was, again, increases in lean mass uh, and bone mineral content. And over the four years, they did, in fact, have an, a significant increase in weight. Um, and that's what you would expect. You know, you, you go onto a college campus to play American football, they're going to pack some some pounds on you. Absolutely. That's kind that's of the, the goal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now they didn't actually looking purely at fat mass, ha- they did not have a significant increase in fat mass, which is quite good. Um, I think a lot of times you worry about bringing these guys on and, you know, you need to load them up with a bunch of, of lean mass and you, you kind of worry that they're going to be overfed or encouraged to kind of overeat. And that's not really helping. I mean, to some extent, if you're a lineman, you, you really do just need mass um, you know, I've, I've talked to several linemen who are like, they're kind of always fighting that battle of like, well, we want to gain weight, but do we really want to put on a bunch of fat? But talk to a defensive lineman, playing defensive line at 300 pounds feels a lot different than playing it at 380. I mean, I'm sorry, 280. Yeah, definitely. Um, even if it's not, you know, pure lean mass that you're putting on, it, when you're leaning into really heavy bodies, Having a little bit of extra weight helps. But as we'll talk about when it comes to like after the career, you kind of have a almost like a moral responsibility to make sure that you're not setting these young athletes up for metabolic dysfunction later in life. So when I look at those results and I say, okay, four years, we put on bone content, we put put on lean mass, we gained weight, but fat gains were not significant. To me, that's a really promising outlook. 